I can think of symbols because the faith of myths is strictly tied to the faith of symbols. According to Proclus, the myth and symbol were two species of the same genus, and when at the beginning of the 19th century, Hoyter tried to recollect the various classical definitions of symbol, on what side they distinguished between symbols that speak to the eyes and myth that speak to the ear, but on the other side, he admitted that in the classical tradition, Thomas frequently spoke of symbolical myths. And Mark often said that the myth is the exegesis of a symbol. The notion of symbol is a very controversial one. We take symbol in the sense of traditions and mathematicians. Then a symbol is whether signified or related to its meaning by a law, that is by a precise convention, and as such interpretable by other signifiers, or it is a variable that can be bounded in many ways, but then once it has acquired a given value, cannot represent other values within the same context. If we take symbol in the sense of uh, Saussure or Yetter, we find as in instances of symbol the cross, the hammer and the symbol, emblems, and the heraldic images. In this sense, symbols can be related to myths only in myths are the mere rhetorical disguise of rational discourses that can be univocally paraphrased and fully translated by no figurative discourses. And symbols become then identical with other words. If on the contrary, we take symbols as the signifiers of imprecise clouds or nebulae of beings that they leave continually unexploited or unexploitable, then symbols are linked to me insofar as me reveals something to our intuition but cannot be paraphrased or translated without losing their revealing power. Thus, me develop into specific symbols, as it has been said, or displayed while the most symbols are there for use, or they expand and verbalize the symbol. According to Goethe, Symbolism transforms the experience into an idea and the idea into an image, so that the idea expressed from the image remains always active and unattainable, and even though expressed in all languages, remains unexpressible. Allegory transforms an experience into a concept and the concept into an image, but so that the concept remains always defined and expressible by the image and walk. Good the definition seems perfectly in tune with the one advocated by the idealistic uh, philosophers, even though idealists did not fully agree on the nature of a symbolism. In present times, when we speak of symbols in poetry, psychoanalysis, and even in the criticism of our unconscious ideological attitudes in everyday life, it seems we use this term in the romantic, Gothian sense. But when we speak of symbols in logic or mathematics, we use it in the opposite way. Such an ambiguity has its own roots in the Greek etymology. Originally, the symbol was a token, the present act of a broken table or coin or metal that performed its social and semiotic function by recalling the absent cap to which it could have been potentially reconnected. This potentiality was indeed crucial because since the two halves could have been reconnected, it was more necessary to yearn for the reconnection. Thus it happens then when we enter a theater with our ticket, which is a symbol, nobody tries to check where it is the second half, and everyone trusts the semiotic nature of the token, which in this case works on the basis of an established and recognized convention. But the present half of the broken middle could be or could have been reconnected, and the ghost of its absent companion, furthermore, the ghost of the imagined original wholeness, and cross all the sense 
Thus, the verb sumale came to mean to meet, to try an interpretation, to make a conjecture, to solve the riddle, to infer from something imprecise because incomplete, something else that it suggested, evoked, revealed, but did not conventionally say. In this sense, the symbol was an ominous, subtle experience that announced vague nonsense to be tentatively forecast. It was a senator, but a senator was an impalpable voyage. It was a divine message. And when God was speaking tones, never was there a mistake. But nobody can spell out in clear words what one has understood. I would like to deal with God today, the logical mathematical nature of symbol, and to try to understand how much modern is the poetical, critical, psychological one. My opinion is that it arrives far before the romantic aesthetics, but that it is less archaic and originally than usually believe. In etymological terms, we have seen that all the sense of the word symbol were equally archaic. When the supporters of the last uh, sense, the Goethean one, they say, try to trace back its profoundly traditional origin, they do look for a vulnerable pedigree, but they disregard the fact that the distinction between the symbol and allegory is not a tie at all. When in the stone period were made the first attempts to read allegorical the old poets, so to find under the clothes of myths the evidence of natural truths, or when Philo of Alexandria started the allegorical reading of the Bible, there was not a strife of war distinction between symbol and allegory. The pen and Auerbach say that the classical world took symbol and allegory as synonymous expressions and that they called the symbols also serving code and even distributed for dinascal purposes. Under such a linguistic usage, there was the idea that symbols too were a rhetorical device endowed with a precise meaning. A meaning obscurely outlined, but to be precisely found. And the same happened with the tradition of the church fathers and with the medieval culture. There is, however, in the patristic and medieval tradition, an idea of symbolism as a way of speaking of something unknowable. In the Neoplatonic line of thought, as represented by the pseudo Dionysius Gerardo Pachai, the divine source of all beings, the one with capital O, is defined as the luminous dimness, a silence which teaches secretly a flashing darkness with, which is neither body nor figure, no shape, which has no quantity, no quality, no weight which is not in a place and doesn't see, has no sensitivity, is neither soul nor mind, has no imagination or opinion, is neither number nor order nor greatness, is not a substance, not eternity, not time, not obscurity, not error, not light, not truth. How to speak of such a non-entity <laughs> and non-identity is a serious matter. It's not by a language whose signs have no literal and universal meaning but are open to contrasting interpretations. Dionysius speaks, for his negative theology, of symbols that are not fully transformed allegories. In a neo-Platonic perspective, the source of the cosmic emanation being beyond any rational knowledge, and from our point of view, appearing as mere nothingness, we must say of it something which is true and false at the same time. This contradictoriness of neoplatonic symbols seems to share the same ambiguity that the romantic symbol. Nevertheless, the neoplatonism of Dionysius and furthermore the one of his commentators, such as Aquinas, is not a strong one. Medieval neoplatonists try to translate the pantheistic idea of emanation into the non-pantheistic one of participation. It's true that the one is absolutely transcendent and infinitely far from us, that we are made 
different fabric since we are the mere litter of his creative energy. But he is not contradictory in himself. Contradictoriness belongs to our discourses about him and arise from our imperfect knowledge of him. But the knowledge he has of himself is totally ambiguous. This is a very important point because we shall see the hermetic platonists of the Renaissance maintain that the very core of every secret knowledge is the faith in the very contradictoriness of reality. On the contrary, for the medieval theology, contradictoriness and ambiguity are merely semiotic and not ontological. Naturally, since we must speak of the unspeakable, we name it as goodness, truth, beauty, art, jealousy, and so on. But these terms, say Dionysius, can be applied to him only supersubstantially. Not only, since our divine names will always be inadequate, it is indispensable to choose them according to a criterion of deformity. It is dangerous to name God as beauty or life, because one can believe that such relations do convey some of his real qualities, which is not. We should rather call him as lion, hunter, bear, monster. We should apply to him the most provocatory adjective, so that it be clear that the similarity we are looking for escapes us or can only be glimpsed at the cost of a disproportionate proportion. However, this symbolical way of speaking has nothing to do with the sudden illumination, with the cognitive ecstasy, with the flashing vision of which speak the modern theories of symbolism. The medieval metaphysical symbol is neither epiphany nor revelation of the truth concealed under the clouds of myth. Symbolists must make rationally conceivable the inadequacy of our reason and of our language. Challenged by this difficulty, Dionysius commentators try to translate his approach into rational terms and from Scotus and Eugena to Aquinas, they were no more speaking of a network of ungraspable similitudes, but rather of that uninterrupted sequence of causes and effects that will be later called the great chain of being. And Aquinas will definitely transform this approach into the doctrine of analogia and which came at being a proportion of calculus. Thus, at the very root of the medieval pan-semiotical metaphysics, that was something defined as a universal symbolism, there is a quest for a code, and they will do, and they will to transform a poetic approximation into the philosophical state. Now, parallel to the Neoplatonic line of thought, there is the hermeneutic tradition of scriptural interpreters, interested in the symbolic language by which not the universe but the holy scriptures speak to us. The holy scriptures were true, the Old and the New Testament. At the beginning, the Gnostics assumed that only the New Testament was true, and Origenes wanted to keep the continuity between the two testaments. But he had to decide in which way they were saying the same thing, since apparently they were speaking differently. Thus, he made the decision to read them in a parallel way. The old is the signifier of the letter, for which the new is the signifier of the spirit. At the same time, the new was the letter whose spirit concerning salvation the symbiosis process was thus rather complicated. There was the first group speaking of the courage of, of the second one, and the second one speaking through parables of something else. Moreover, in this beautiful case of unlimited symbiosis, there was a puzzling identification between the sender, the divine logos, the signifying message, words, logos, the content, the divine message, logos, the referent, the Christ, the logos. A web of identities and differences complicated by the fact that Christ, as follows, insofar as he was himself of all the divine mark, 
was fundamentally polysemous. That both testaments spoke at the same time of their saying and their content of their rhetoric and their meaning one the nebula of all possible archetypes. The scriptures were in the position of saying everything, and everything was too much for interpreters interested in truth. The symbolical nature of the falling books had thus to be changed. Therefore, the symbolic mode had to be identified with the allegorical one. This is a very delicate point, because without this profound need of a code, the scriptural interpretation would look very similar to our modern theories of deconstruction, partial interpretive drift, misprision, libidinal reading, free jouissance, final celebration of the Valerie's dictum, il n'y a pas de présence dans le texte. The scriptures had potentially every possible meaning, but their reading had to be governed by a code, and that is why the fathers performed the theory of allegorical sense. In the beginning, the sense of were three, they were more mystic, then they became four, they were allegorical, moral, and allegorical. And the theory of the four senses provides a sort of guarantee for the correct decoding of the books. But the patristic and scholastic mind could never avoid the feeling of inexhaustible, inexhaustible profundity of the scriptures, frequently compared to a forest or to an ocean. St. Jerome's is of infinite sins to the sea. Ocean mysterioso day, labyrinth. Origin spoke of big forest of a sea, wherein we enter with a small boat, our mind is caught by the fear, and we are submerged by its words. Gilbert of Stanford said that the Holy Scriptures are a rapid river that flows by producing new senses that light waves come one after the other in such a way. However, that no annuls the orders but altogether remain to increasingly enrich such an immense treasury of divine wisdom. And everyone, according to one's one intellectual ability, can get something from this inexhaustible storage of senses. Once again, we get here something which recalls the modern fascination of the novel textual reading and even the post Hedibarian. Uh, the hermeneutic idea that the text magnetizes upon the needs of the whole of the readings that has been elicited in the course of history. But the patristic and the different problem was how to reconcile the infinity of interpretation with the univocality of the message. How to read the books by discovering them not new things, but the same everlasting truth rephrased in even new ways. No novel said novel, not new things, but in a new way. Thus the church had to guarantee the continuity of the interpretive tradition, and the interpretive tradition guaranteed the right of the church to be the warrant of the interpretation. Quis custodia custodes. How can the authority legitimate the interpretation since the authority is said? is legitimated by the interpretation. This question had no answer. No theory of types, no meta language, was elaborated to legitimate the circle of hermeneutic legitimation. No theory of hermeneutic legitimation can be indeed legitimated if not by the very process of hermeneutic reading. At the origins of every in a modern hermeneutic practice, there is a circle. It doesn't matter how holy of how vicious. The only possible answer was an empirical one. The rules of the good interpretation were provided by the gatekeepers of the orthodoxy, and the gatekeepers of the orthodoxy were the winner of the struggle for imposing good interpretation. The text will tell the truth insofar as its reader has the political or rhetorical power to make it to speak in a certain way. The scriptural, scriptural hermeneutics provide the modern sensitivity with the modern of open reading, but in its own terms, 
this gave me such a temptation. That is why time, symbol, and other glory were indistinguishable. In order to consider them as two different procedures, as the did, the Western civilization had collaborated different notions of truth. Thank you. 
origin of the real world. In this encyclopedia, the same object of creature can assume the contrasting meanings so that the light means the same time the figure of Christ and the figure of the devil. But the work of the medieval commentators was to provide rules for a correct textual disambiguation. Symbols were ambiguous within the paradise, never within the syntax. An elephant, a unicorn, a jewel, a stone, a flower can assume many meanings, but when they show up in a given context, they have to be decoded in the only possible right way. Thus, the rise of scriptural hermeneutics encouraged the growth of a universal symbolism and the real world became as much perfused with size as the Holy Scriptures. But in both cases, one should more rigorously speak of scriptural and universal allegorism. Middle Ages couldn't understand the antinomy outlined by Goethe. <coughs> However, these universal allegories will implement the sort of hallucinatory experience of the world according to which mundane creatures and historical facts didn't count as they were these creatures and these facts, but insofar as they were scanned for such things and such an attitude, couldn't be accepted by the Aristotelian negatives of the 13th century. Thomas Aquinas was pretty severe with profane poetry and the liberalism in Paris. Poetry was an inferior doctrine. But he was equally severe with extra Bible for allegory and impacts. Apropos of the foreign text, he was a man who was a poor, throwing literal or historical text for the Bible, says that the Hebrew people escaped from Egypt. It tells literally the truth. But when one has read this bit of sense, one can try to catch through it beyond it the spiritual sense that is the sense that the spiritual tradition is signed to the same rules, mainly the allegorical, the moral, and the allegorical mystic part. Up to this point, the uh, Bible doesn't say anything original, but he makes two important and puzzling statements. First, the spiritual sense only holds from the facts told by the scriptures. Only the course of the sacred history God has acted upon the mundane events so to make them to signify something else. There is no spiritual sense in the profane history, nor in the individuals and facts of the nature of the world. There is no mystical meaning in what happens after the redemption. The universal allegory is thus liquidated. Mountain and events are restituted to their naturality. With Aquinas, one witnesses a sort of secularization of the post biblical history and of the natural world. The second statement, if there is a spiritual sense in the Holy Scriptures, where facts means are yes, there is no spiritual sense in profane poetry. Poetry displays only literal sense. These tendencies are now a bit too crude and radical. Uh, Aquinas, a poet, said, and did what? Knew very well that poets use rhetorical figures and other words. But, he said, the poetical second sense, the sense of metaphor of an allegory, is simply a subspecies of the literal one, and he called it parabolical sense. This sense, no super credit of modern literary. It is simply a variety of the literal sense. When the scriptures represent Christ by the image of a girl, one is not facing a case of allegory and practice, but of simple allegory and practice. This girl is not a fact that symbolizes a future event, but only the word that parabolically therefore literally stand for the name Christ. In which way the parabolical sense is different from the spiritual senses of the scriptures? To understand this point is highly controversial. One must understand what did Aquinas mean by literal sense. He meant the sense 
quan autor intended. No? The sense intended by the author. You could call it now intended meaning. In the words of Christ. The literal sense is not only the meaning of the sentence, but also the meaning of the utterance of that sentence. Modern pragmatics know that that provides the sentence such as to go here. According to the dictionary, the meaning is a simple statement about the temperature of a, of a certain place. But if the sentence is uttered in given circumstances, it can also convey the actual intention, the intended meaning of its utter. For instance, please let's go outside. It must be clear that sentence meaning and utterance meaning for requirements belong both to the literal sense, since they represent what the utterer of the sentence had in his mind. And from this point of view, one understands why the sense conveyed by tropes and other stories, insofar as it represented exactly what the author wanted to say, can be easily reduced to literal sense. But why the spiritual sense of the scriptures are not equally literal? Because the biblical authors were unaware of conveying to their historical report the senses that, in the mind of God, but not in their own mind, facts should have assumed for the future readers able to read in the Old Testament the forecast of the New. The authors of the scriptures wrote under divine inspiration, ignoring what they were really saying. It doesn't seem however that the quietest proposal was so influential. In the first disquieting instance of the phenomenon is given by the theory of allegorical reading of the divine comedy as put forth by Dante in the Istula 13, in the letter 13, in which he presents this poem to Cancarni de la Scala and makes it immediately clear that this poem has to be read as polysemos with many senses. One of the most celebrated examples of what Dante means by polysemy is given by his analysis of the verses of the Psalm 113, Mexico, Israel, the Egypto, Rome, Barba, the Porto, Barba, the Artes, the Dias, and the Catuaries, and so on and so forth, which describe uh, the, the Hebrew people that abandoned Egypt and says, Dante. If we look at the letter, it means the exodus of the sons of Israel from Egypt at the time of Moses. If we look at the allegory, it means our redemption through Christ. If we look at the moral sense, it means the conversion of the soul from the misery of sin to the state of grace. If we look at the mystical sense, it means the departure of the sanctified spirit from the servitude of his corruption to the freedom of the eternal blood. Apparently, there is nothing in this analysis which contradicts the main lines of the scriptural tradition. But many interpreters felt something uncanny. Here, Dante is talking, is taking a case of Bible reading as an example as to read his mundane poem. The most obvious solution that has been proposed by many interpreters is that this letter is a forgery. It should be a forgery because Dante was supposed to be a faithful Thomist. And this letter contradicts the Thomist disposition according to which profane poetry has only a literal sense. Anyway, even though the letter was a forgery, this forgery has been taken from the beginning as authentic. It means that it didn't, it didn't sound so repugnant to the ears of Dante's contemporaries. Moreover, Dante's Covidium is certainly not a forgery, and this treatise that provides clues for interpreting allegorically his own poems, even though still maintain the distinction between allegory of poet and allegory of theologians that the letter 13 disregards. However, in the Covidium, Dante explains what he intentionally meant in writing these poems during the study. And in this sense, one would say that he doesn't detach himself 
from the Thomistic point of view. The allegorical sense of his poem still is a parabolical one because it represents what I was intended to be. On the contrary, in the letter 13, the examples he gives make one think of blackened cases of allegory in factice. Furthermore, we know that he had always read the facts told by mythology in the words of classical poets as they were allegory in practice. In such terms, he speaks of the poets in the Bulgarian of Rindia, and in the comedy, he said, the statue in poet, he that the one who proceeds in the night and bears a lie, not for himself, but for those who follow, follow him. His mean and statues was conceived by Dante as a seer. His poetry and the pagan poetry in general and the facts told by this poetry convey the spiritual senses of which the authors were not aware. Thus, Ogan, the poets are continuing the work of the Holy Scriptures, and this poem is a new instance of prophetic bounty. <coughs> his poem is endowed with spiritual senses in the same way in which the scriptures were, and the poet is divinely inspired. Thus, just at the moment in which Aquinas devaluates the poetical mode, poets escaping from his intellectual influence start a new mystical approach to the poetic text, opening a new way of reading the text through various avatars which survive until our times. What makes Dante still digital is the fact that it's still believe that the poem has not infinite or indefinite meanings. That seems to maintain that the spiritual meanings are four and that they can be encoded and decoded according to the psychological convention, which means that not even that the trace precise borderlines between the symbol and our world. But if the scriptural interpreters were warranted about their right reading of the scripture because the long tradition which provided the criterion for a correct interpretation. What will happen now that the profane world has been devoid of any mystic sense by the cultures and that it is uncertain under the inspiration of who? God, love, or as the boy unconsciously speak. In a way, the theological secularization of the natural world implemented by Aquinas has set free the mystical drives of the poetic activity. It is the time when Pangatino Musato starts speaking of the poeta theologus. That fascinated John to see how irrelevant and definitely the epistemological break will take place during humanism and Renaissance. The heraldic world of vestries and lapidaries has not fully lost its appeal. Major science world the world is becoming more and more quantitatively and mathematically oriented. Aristotle seems not to have anything more to say. But the new philosophers, every era has its own nucleus law, and the ones it deserves began exploring a new symbolic forest where living pillars whispered confused by fascinating words coming from a Platonism revisited under the influence of the Kabbalah and of the Corpus Hermeticum. In this new philosophical media, the very dear idea of symbol underwent profound change. In order to conceive of a different idea of symbol, something that sends one back to this theory of reality that cannot be conceptually expressed because it is self-contradictory. One means a very strong neoplatonist. As I have suggested, the medieval neoplatonist was not strong enough because it was emasculated or made more virile by a strong idea of the divine transcendence. I mean by strong neoplatonist, the neoplatonism of the origins, placed until Proclus and uh, these Gnostic versions, according to which the top of the great four of peace 
there is a one which is not only unknowable and obscure, but who, being independent of any determination, can contain all of them, and it is consequently the place of all contradiction. If we merge these three lines of influence, the Neopatonic doctrine of emanation by nature of which there is a physical kinship, that is an anarchistic continuity between every element of the knowledge of the world and the original one. The idea that this one is self-contradictory and one can find in it the coincidentia oppositorum. And there are many the ideas indeed, but which is reinforced by the philosophical views of Nicholas of Hughes and of Jordan Group. And third, the idea that every possible representation of the one can but send back to another representation equally obscure and contradictory, then we meet the requirements for the development of the philosophy of aesthetics, of the secret science of symbols as intuitive revelations that can be neither verbalized nor conceptualized. The main feature of the so-called romantic tradition that spread around from the Renaissance and Permission, the romantic philosophy and many contemporary theories of artistic interpretation are, and I follow some suggestions of Gilbert Dumont, first, the refusal of the metric measure position of the quantitative the quantitative the belief that nothing is stable and that every element of the universe acts over any other through result of action. The refusal of causalism so that the reciprocal action of the various elements of the universe doesn't follow the linear sequence of cause to effect, but rather a sort of spiral-like logic of mutually sympathetic elements. If the universe is a network of similitudes, and cosmic sympathies, there are no longer privileges, cause of change. Third, the refusal of dualism, so that the very identity principle collapses, as well as the one of the excluded middle, and Hercule Dato, that's the idea of coincidental postural. And fourth, the refusal of agnosticism. One should think that agnosticism is a very modern attitude, and that from this point of view, the hermetic tradition cannot be opposed to the scholastic one. But medieval, even though they were credulous, had a very sharp sense of discrimination between opposites. They did a certain use experimental methods for ascertaining what was and what wasn't the case, but they were profoundly interested in determining what was the case. That you not know that. On the contrary, the hermetic tradition is based on, on the principle of similitude, sequel superbius, sit inferius. And once one has decided to fish for similitude, <coughs> one can find similitudes everywhere, since, under a certain description, everything can be seen as similar to everything else. An interesting instance of this way of thinking, not accidentally dead with the hermetic tradition, is the union of the of single science paradigm. Full of that brings meaning self contradictory. Archetypal images are so broad with meanings that one can never say what they definitely mean. Such a vagueness is so constitutive of their nature that when we risk transforming symbols of our culture into stereotyped elements, <coughs> then we must shift to the symbols of a more exotic culture since they, looking unfamiliar, still keep and over the man. There is a symbol, but something can be at the same time, humanist aesthetics. The so called symbol becomes to live and interpretable, it loses its symbolic power. Thus, such a new symbol is the great group in the hermetic atmosphere, from Pico della Mirano del Piccino, Giordano Bruno, from Russian and Robert Flood up to the French symbolism, Yeats, and many contemporary theories. Speaking of the unshaped, unshaped. Symbols cannot have a definite meaning. Thus, and universal things that influence the new theories of the new practices of poetry and art, as well as new theories of being, and definitely provide a new religion for many laymen that in the secularized world did not believe any longer in the God of theology, but need some other form 
same everlasting message, then there is an inexhaustible variety of signifiers for a unique signifier. In the latter of sin, symbols have any possible meaning because of the inner contradictoriness of reality. But since every symbol speaks about this fundamental contradictoriness, then an inexhaustible quantity of signifiers always tend for that unique signifier, the, inex the inexhaustibility of the senses of any text. Symbol speaks only of the reality. The reason I ran, in a way, more with the medieval enlightenment than with contemporary religiosity is the following. I suspect that many modern theories have too strictly identified symbols with myths. If a myth is a tale, it is a text. And this text, as Bakofi said, is the exegesis of the symbol. Let's take a myth as a text, and metaphorically, if you want, as the paradigmatic example of every possible text. A text is a place where the irreducible polysemy of symbols is reduced because their symbols are anchored to their own context. Regimas were right in the sense that one should look for rules of contextual disambiguation, of the disambiguation, and exaggerate per of symbols. The modern sensitivity deals, on the contrary, with texts as made of symbols, and while acknowledging the infinite polysophy of symbols, doesn't recognize the longer that the that discipline that means imposed upon the symbols they use. Thus, some modern theories are unable to realize that symbols are paradigmatically open to infinite meaning, but syntagmatically textually bound to indefinite, but by no means infinite, interpretation. And perhaps we should revive, rewrite the traditional handbooks which tell the story of how, when, and why modern men escape from the dark ages and enter the age of reason. Thank <laughs> you.